how much to tell and when to tell it and how to tell it. Folks, I'm talking about exposition. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And gosh, I got to say, I am so pleased to have with me today the writer-director of After Sun, Charlotte Wells. And you know, we talk a lot about exposition because there are many beautiful things about After Sun, and one of them truly is exposition. What to tell and when to tell it and how to tell it. That's something I really admire about this film, amongst other things. And look, as you usual the first half of this podcast is spoiler free so if you have not yet seen after sun you could hear our full conversation about writing and then you'll hear the spoiler announcement midway through and if you haven't seen after sun you got to fix that go go see after sun but look charlotte was very forthcoming about her creative process and what it took to get this film in the can so i know you'll dig this episode and speaking of things to dig backstory magazine just turned 10 that's right we have lasted a decade and we couldn't have done it without you of course now is the perfect time to become a subscriber. And look, you know, we just published our Wakanda Forever issue, which has a lot of award season coverage in it. So it is a perfect time to get in and read us. If you want to see what's in the issue, you can see our table of contents over at Backstory.net and surf around there. And if you've never read us before, you could, of course, read our free issue at Backstory.net or on our iPad app entitled Backstory. And look, just to make the idea of becoming a subscriber or giving a gift subscription even more appealing, I am offering you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with writer-director Charlotte Wells about her debut feature film, After Sun. I really dug your film and I want to talk about it, but I want to flash back and give our listeners and iTunes and Spotify and the watchers of this and the Backstory Magazine YouTube page a little bit of your background. I believe you grew up in Scotland, but you have an American accent, just kind of like the gal in the movie. Tell us about where you grew up and also your interest in becoming a writer director. Like at what age did you know you wanted to be a storyteller? I did grow up in Scotland. I lived there um, for the most part until I was 18, 19 years old. My accent is corrupt. It is true. I've lived in New York for almost 10 years, which I suppose makes me officially a New Yorker by that 10 year measure. My accent, I can assure you, gets stronger when I go back home because my family will never, ever let me live it down. I think the the idea of filmmaking, of being a director, really without any sense of what that meant, first crossed my mind as a teenager when I spent all of my time at the movies, you know, just seeing whatever was on at the multiplex. I had one of those passes. It was £9.99 a month and you could see as much as you wanted of anything. And and that's what I did. But I really had no real understanding of what it meant to make films. And ultimately, it was not something that I was led to believe would ever be possible. And so that was something that I, I set aside for another 10, 15 years. I took a fairly roundabout path but what it was that brought me back to it was working with a friend from high school, actually. We, we ran a company together that was in the film industry, on the services side of the industry. And I used that experience helping him run the company to apply to NYU's fairly unique producing program, which is a collaboration between the film and business schools. It was an MBA and an MFA. And there I had the opportunity to make a film and I didn't think twice. And that was my first film. I made it in 2015. It's called Tuesday. I had this kind of dream team of teachers teachers in that very first semester I spent in the film school. I had Todd Salons for writing. I had Alexander Rockwell for directing, Casey Levins for directing the actor. Wow. So certainly had a, a good deal of support around me. And the three of them were very encouraging um, of, of the project that I was working on. And ultimately what they gave me was the conviction that there was something there. Todd read the first draft of something I'd, I'd ever written. And that was what he said. He said, there's something here. And I think that was all I really needed to hear the same with Alex and, and Casey in the work I was doing in those classes. And I made that film and it was such a satisfying collaboration with my peers, the cinematographer Samuel Grandchamp, who, who worked on that with me. It, it was just such a balanced collaboration where no person's point of 
of view was always correct, but it was always heard and a consensus was always reached. And and I found such a clear sense of purpose and joy in that, that caused me to defect from the producing program. Or I didn't defect from the program. I actually continued to produce throughout film school, but ultimately divert my attentions toward writing and directing. And that is what I began to focus on. And After Sun, in fact, was conceived in its very seat-like form just after I made that first short film. So it's been a long time. That's fantastic. Well, you know, going back for a second, what was the like ancillary film business that you started working in with your friend that that kind of gave you a little bit of a pathway or at least let you know that there's nothing magical about film, right? Because you were working in it and you're like, you know what? I could apply to NYU. Like I could do this. I mean, it's kind of a funny story. He wanted me to go on a skiing holiday with his family, but I couldn't afford to go. And and so he got me a few days work working on the third parts of the Caribbean film, which was shooting at Pinewood. And he was a second unit DIT. And so I joined him for maybe five days uh, as an assistant uh, in order to go on this this holiday. <laughs> and out of the experience of working on on pirates, and that was really the point at which the industry was transitioning into into digital, and digital was becoming the status quo, and it had really opened up this niche and need for data technicians and, and people to handle the data. So he was he was a DIT. A DIT is a digital imaging technician. So essentially, they are the digital loader. They take on that the memory cards, but but also also handling kind of looks that they get loaded into monitors. They are in, in the most creative version that they work with with DPs to kind of establish the look and they handle the workflow on, on set. And so, yeah, it gave me a bit of insight into the industry. Like I was really working on the business end of things while Callum continued to work on set and we built the company. I mean, now they're much bigger and somewhat contrary to the in- initial idea of the founding of the company, they, they do a lot of work with film and, and they have scanners. They, they do all of uh, codex scanning in the UK now and they've, they've become a, a pretty big deal. Um, that's great. It's called Digital Orchard. I like that name. Well, that's that's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way to 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 kind of get in there. Did Digital Orchard do anything on your on your film on Afterzone? Well, ideally, they were they were due to do all of our scanning work. But what happened was because we were shooting during the pandemic, the border closed between Turkey and the UK. Right. And so they they did they did the work for our tests and they did the work for a day pickup that we did. We picked up the rave for one day in London last December um, or the December before last now in 2021. But yeah, and unfortunately, unfortunately, their role was limited because of those I border think. closures, which meant our producers had to get very creative about how to develop our film. I know that your lineage was you kept going on to short films. You got a short film into Sundance and South by Southwest, and you were recognized at Sundance, I believe, with an editing award. Yeah, that's right. Blair, Blair McClendon um, won that award. Blair, who I continue to work with on my next short and on After Sun. Uh, and so it's been really nice to keep the keep the same creative collaborations uh, going and, and growing. And it, it's true that my second short film, which was called Lapse, is a six minute short about a sexual assault in plain sight on the New York City subway. It got into Sundance and Sundance, if not open, certainly presented a lot of doors to me and allowed me to meet a lot of people. And after the, the screening, you know, everything happened in the same year. All three of my shorts started to screen in 2017, even though they had been made in three different calendar years. And after Blue Christmas premiered that same year in Toronto, somebody introduced me to Adela Romanski at Pastel. And that's how that producing relationship, you know, was first established. And, you know, we continued to meet until several years later. I made good on my promise to deliver a script. That's great. Well, t- let's get back to the script. So you said the idea was forming all the way back when you were making your first short in film school. Tell us how the idea formed and and when you realized that it would actually be a film and not a short. I began to work on it in my last year at film school, I, I which was really the second year I'd been in film school because I spent the first year of the program in the business school. And that's the point at which people start thinking aloud about what a feature film might be. And I took an independent study with a professor by the name of Gail Siegel and we didn't begin working concretely on something, but but I came in with this idea of maybe a father and daughter story set at a holiday resort. And that was really all I had. And it had been inspired by flipping through old holiday albums that summer at my mom's house, being struck by how young my dad looked at the point where I was really approaching that age myself. But I think in a lot of ways, it was a continuation of that first short film. It, it is a continued exploration of grief. And I think I still had something to discover for myself about that and about that time in my life and and something more to say on film though that wasn't necessarily clear to me until more recently i think often at least you know speaking for myself i don't know if this is true of others but i think often i start projects 
thinking they are one thing and that thing is something with more distance from myself and discovering over time that they are in fact an expression of, of something within me that may have been too difficult or terrifying <laughs> to admit at first blush of the idea of, of kind of giving that much of myself to something that would ultimately be public. Even though I do consider all of these films fiction, there there absolutely is something of me in them. And I think it just takes a little bit of kind of denial or (laughs) self-delusion to to arrive at that point where I realized what what it is that I really set out to do. And that was certainly true of After Sun. I spent that semester looking at other father and daughter films, films like Alice in the Cities or Paper Moon or Tomboy somewhere was an early one. Yeah, only over the course of writing it and spending another few years really trying to crack the script did I realize that this was a film about grief and a film about memory. What year would you say you got your first draft completed? I can tell you very specifically. I completed it in February of 2019 and I wrote it all at once and I always knew that I would, which is why when I met Adela and the folks over at Pastel, I promised them a script in two weeks because I knew it would take me two weeks to write. I just didn't know it would take me two years to arrive at the point where lightning struck. And it really wasn't as simple as lightning striking. I had been working in those two years and laying out the the world and writing down memories and moments and anecdotes and snippets of dialogue that were remembered and imagined. It was only when I, I finally wrote in a rush that I could step back and see what this was and be surprised by some of what found its way onto the page. Okay, so here's a question I have for a lot of writers that that talk about writing down snippets of dialogue, memories, things like that. It almost sounds like you're journaling. And one of the difficult things, at least for me, that I could never wrap my head around is the concept of collating all that. So do you use a bunch of notes app documents on your phone? Do you use Microsoft Word document on a computer? Are you are you doing this on paper and then later typing it in or is it never typed in? So tell us about that kind of process that I would assume would lead to an outline and you could tell me if it did or it didn't. Well, this is where I'm going to sound like I'm paid to promote a piece of software that I'm not. Um, but I, I really do think it was part of what allowed me to crack the script. So, so at first, everything was scattered. It was on paper. It was in my notes app, which I am a big fan of. It was an email sent to myself. It was on Microsoft Word documents. It was in final draft documents. It was all over the place. And then a friend told me about Scrivener. Do you know mm-hmm. it? Yeah, I do. It just allowed me to put everything in one place. It allowed me to put photographs. It allowed me to include links to things, PDFs. And ultimately, it gave me reason to work through my mess of notes and, and organize them and put them in one place. And I am very methodical about the way that I write. I structure things with fairly distinct lines and breaks and there was a lot of intention to how I structured After Sun and I think the ability to move scenes around at will without needing to kind of cut and scroll and paste was really helpful as was the kind of index carding that Scrivener allowed. And that did build to an outline and that outline was really, that was the hardest part because when I had that outline, that was when I started writing. And that outline was really, it was two pages. There were seven headings, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. And in terms of kind of this journaling process you spoke of, it was really about placing those moments, details, pieces of dialogue into one of the seven dates. And of course, it wasn't arbitrary. At that point, I held in my head a very clear understanding of who these characters were and how their relationship kind of evolved over the course of of the script. And so there were these little arcs building over the course of the film that slowly move things along. And I went to a QA, and um, a screening of All the Beauty and the Bloodshed two days ago, and Laura Poitras spoke of structure, and it was she, she'd articulated something that I had been struggling to wrap my head around, for which I was very grateful. She talked about an editor coming in and, and providing structure, and, and that film is organized by chapters. So the structure is very concrete. And she said that sometimes those you know frames, they dissolve over the course of editing, and sometimes they don't. And in their case, they didn't. And, and the film is organized by chapters. In our case, the lines absolutely did dissolve. And that you know it is down to Blair's work as an editor and being less bound by linearity than I am. But there was a lot of structure to the script and I think there needed to be to keep track of, of how everything evolved and built and accumulated over the course of the film. As you just said, is it's seven days. So it's like, you know, if, if you weren't using a digital program, you could put those day one, day two on a wall in front of you 
and then just the topics below. So, I mean, just as you are not paid to promote Scrivener, like Final Draft is sometimes a sponsor of ours, but not today. And the only thing I'll tell you that might surprise you, because not everybody knows this, in Final Draft 12, they came out with something called a beat board and basically a digital board behind your script that you could just like open up and you could put pictures, music, links, long ass notes, whatever you want on it. And that's been really useful. And there's also a thing that actually you can drag cards around that are linked to scenes in your script without copy and pasting them, even when you're writing your script. So interesting. They have like online tutorials for it. It's just a part of the software. It's not like something extra, but, but something that I'm definitely not paid to promote that I always love bringing up when people bring up stuffing like this, there was an app called Wonderlist, and it was bought by Microsoft mm-hmm. and it became the free app Microsoft to do. And most people would use it for a shopping list, right? It would say like my shopping list. And then it's like get corn, you know, like frozen pizza, whatever your list. And each list element is like its own tab. But each tab has room yeah. for notes. And I have found it's a really interesting organizing tool, even for a script, because you could move corn and frozen pizza up and down with such ease that it's almost like yeah, exactly. one of the digital note cards. And I absolutely love the to-do app. I use it for the magazine, for the podcast, everything. So that would be the app that I would pimp. But back to your outline, okay. how long would you say it took you to really get to that point when you were ready to script? Because some writers would say the outline could take months of, months on end, or it could be something like you said, where you were journaling and you were leading into it for, for quite a long time. When you really said, all right, I'm going to write this damn script. I'm going to get into outline form. How much time would you say you were spending on that? Well, I don't know that I knew I needed to get into the outline form. I'm definitely not a person who finds value in treatment as part of my own process. Like I really want that outline to be as skeletal as possible so that I can discover when it comes to actually writing the script and the scenes. That is the the joy of writing to me is knowing where you're starting, knowing a place or or one detail within the scene and then discovering what what is going to exist around it. I took that class in the fall of 2015. I left the program in the spring of 2016, was working on the short. So I'd say that really by 2017, I was turning my attention toward trying to crack after some with a little bit more vigor. Uh, so, so I would say it took it took a good two years, good two years to crack that outline. But and and I think at the time I, I didn't feel good about that, and I felt like I was failing and and wasting my time and procrastinating and you know watching too much and listening to too much and falling down various rabbit holes. But the truth is, I can now look back and see the value in that time and see that I was working and I was developing my understanding of the material and and the world beyond my own experiences. Could it be more efficient? I hope so, uh, looking forward. But I think it was it was what I needed to do then. And, you know, moments like, you know, there's a scene at the end of the film in which under pressure plays a role. And I don't think that widely vocal emphasized version of Under Pressure was something I discovered during that process of listening to songs and falling down rabbit holes and just allowing myself to be inspired by what I happened upon. And so I think a lot of that work does come around and the character work that I did and then the writing of these memories and seeing how they piece together. It it was work. I think it sometimes, at least as a a first time feature maker, it's sometimes easy to think that writing, just like editing, happens at a keyboard, you know, or or with a pen in hand. And that it's just not true. So much of it is thinking, so much of it is is staring at walls and walking around the block. And that was where I think writing and editing had such strong parallels in a way I didn't expect that that so much of that work was done in conversation and, and the differences that with editing you have a partner. And you're working with an editor and you're staring at the wall together and you're reorganizing index cards. Because ultimately, while while I did use Scrivener to kind of crack the first draft and work through redrafts, it ended, it did end in final draft and it ended with index cards on the floor. You're talking about working with an editor before you're shooting. So is when No, 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 no. I'm talking about the 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 the, the index cards were both part of the writing process and then they were part of the post-production process. Okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it. Just wanted to make sure I was understanding. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it was funny. You were, you were being unnecessarily hard on yourself a moment ago, and you were talking about maybe it was because I was a first-time writer and director. The joke is I've interviewed enough writer-directors to know the process doesn't change or get easier. And, and the truth is you have to give yourself permission to accept that what yeah. you're doing when you're going down the rabbit hole 
is you're allowing your subconscious to fill in the blanks for the story that your conscious is trying to create. That is the thing that I've seen as a through line from all the interviews that I've done in which whether it's writer's block and somebody needs to get up and go for a walk and just get out of their space and change the scenery or that early stage when you're trying to figure out your outline, of course it feels terrible. You don't you're like yeah. you're a sculptor who doesn't even have clay in front of you yet. And then your first draft is your ugly piece of clay that you almost want to throw <laughs> out, you know? So, I mean, it's just like what you're talking about is totally normal and it makes sense because you're really talking about the subconscious journey, especially in your case with something autobiographical where you really have to yeah. let it, you have to let it seep in. And so I, I want to also talk about your habit when you sit down to write. So, I mean, two weeks is pretty fast and crazy. Kudos to you. But Again, most of the writers that I've talked to, when they really have their outline down and they know where they're going, they have that roadmap, the writing usually is fast. And I'm just curious about your writing habit when you're really in the scripting mode. Do you give yourself a page count to hit each day or do you try and give yourself a certain amount of time to write? The page count goal is interesting because for a long time during the course of, of the development work on the script before I'd finally written that first draft, I would sit with a friend in a cafe across the street. I can see it from my window right now. Mm -hmm. And we sat there one day and we said, okay, enough is enough. We're going to send each other two pages a day until we have our script. No matter what, it starts today. This is what we're going to do. And we did it. And and I had 14 pages for you know a year and a half. But on day seven, we both had <laughs> a nervous breakdown and, and couldn't handle the pressure of it anymore. But it really was valuable. And it was, it was like in the end, basically, it was accountability that not just to another person, but the kind of construction of of a pressure that you felt built at the end of the day. So even if it was eleven forty five, you really needed to figure out a way to crack out two pages in fifteen minutes. And I do generally uh, respond well to deadlines and under pressure. And what you just said about it always being this way, I will never forget walking into an advisor's office. Before I studied film, I was studying something else, but I had a paper. I had three papers due the next day, one of which I was working on with him. And I walked in and I said, tell me it will not always be this way. Tell me it will not always be the night before. And I still have so much left to do. And I've left it to the point where the pressure is so high that I will get it done, but I will be so miserable in the process. And he looked at me and in the middle of his room were a pyre of books, just books everywhere but like a like a like a pyre waist high and he said it will always be this way <laughs> and it was so I, I don't know there was actually something freeing in it in 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 knowing that that was true knowing that there would always be one miserable night before a deadline but that I'd always made it in the past and I would make it tonight it was just going to be a really long night and, and so I think that's true I think there is something to accept in in that I do think hopefully there are ways and I can you know in which I can make it better or healthier or however you'd like to phrase it in the future but maybe not well yeah take solace in the fact that it's not just you uh, uh misery loves company there's plenty of other writers going through the exact same thing well so are yeah. you still doing your two page thing like like is that something that you No were... so the two pages didn't work out but to come back to your question so there were two things that I think allowed me to finally write the script the first was the outline like I had the framework I had been trying to build and I knew when I finished it I knew that was it I knew that it would give me the freedom just to you know plow forward with the script. But I think what I also had in those two weeks was structure. I had some other things going on at that point in time. And it meant that I had very specific windows in which I could write. I would wake up early. I would write. I had a short period in the morning and a short period in the afternoon. And because those were the only times of day that I had, I didn't have all day to sit at the cafe and drink 12 coffees and feel sad about not writing. I was just so disciplined and I got up and I wrote and then I put it away and I came back to it and I wrote. And I think actually falling into a routine with such discipline was a big part of it. And the question, of course, is just how you bring that to the rest of your life. Because I have friends whom I envy who can write anytime, anywhere. They can open up their laptop, they have half an hour and they can write. I can't do that. I will never be able to do that. I, it's just not how my psychology, you know, works. I, I know that I need several hours a day to just stare at a blank wall <laughs> um, sure. and to be inside of my head. And, and that's okay. It, it just means that the discipline is going to look a little bit different 
But I think being forced in, into a corner in that instance was helpful. And I think it proves that in both cases, the two page a day and, and, and what happened when I wrote the script, it proves to me at least that writing regularly is the most important thing and allowing yourself to find a rhythm. And it might not be the same time every day. It might not be a page count. It might not be a number of hours, but just writing regularly is really the key. Yeah, totally agree. Well, so, all right, you get your script done. Pastel, I'm guessing, digs it. And then you're on this path to raise the budget. I know that at some point you went to the Sundance Director's Workshop, you know, the lab, because I saw that in your film credits. Did Sundance help you? kind of do any sort of budget raising or or sometimes I know they do matchmaking with financiers of certain projects as well. So was that part of the process? And also how would you say it changed at the lab? And we could save that for the spoilers section if there was a big light bulb moment, but I'm curious what bringing After Sun to the Sundance Lab did for you. So I finished that first draft in February of 2019. I pretended to redraft it for six months, but I am fairly sure that I changed only punctuation. <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and, you know, cleaned up typos. I, I think a few things changed, but nothing substantial. And I, I wish I'd sent it sooner. But I sent it in August. We spoke in September. We started working together and I took some feedback on it for the first time because I really hadn't shared it with anybody. And then that January, a few months later, I took it to the Sundance Lab. I owe the Sundance Lab a great deal for the script, both through the Writer's Lab and then the Director's Lab, which becomes a second Writer's Lab in the summer that I also went through. The first was in person, the second was virtual. So it was 2020. I think I had 45 pages of notes from the Writer's Lab, and I could distill them in one sentence and did. And and that, that was ultimately, after typing them all up, what's up with Callum? which is to say that I had, you know, two lead characters. There were more characters in that draft than there were in the final script. But I had two lead characters, and one of them was just frustratingly illegible to people. And that was what I was clearly something I needed to address. There's also a framing device in in the film in a rave sequence. Some people were on board with the rave and others were not. But it was certainly a question. What's up with Callum and do we need the rave? To rave or not to rave? Since we're in the non-spoiler section, in case there's somebody that hasn't yet seen After Sun, and please correct that, you're you're being crazy. Go see it. Callum's the dad. <laughs> like This is a father-daughter story. So a note of what's Callum's the dad. Character is, is kind of a big note, you know, but so... It's a, oh, it's a big note. It's a big yeah. note. How did you lean into it? Yep. And, and we could talk about it more in the spoilers if we need to. Well, okay, so... I came out of the writer's lab. I wrote my bad draft, which we were told in advance would happen um, because you start writing toward other people's notes and you lose sight of what you're doing. And yeah. everybody went through it. It was, it was terrible. I'd stripped it back, but I'd taken the heart out of it. I salvaged it for a draft that I submitted for the director's lab. And then I went through that in that summer. And I went through another round of, of speaking with writers. And at that point, one of those questions, so what's up with Callum and to rave or not to rave? The, the second of those questions I understood at that point, I knew that we needed the rave. I knew that that was central to what it was I was trying to express in the film and that there was no film without it. Although a film without it felt appealing at times because it felt a lot safer. It felt like I was treading on more known ground. I wanted to find out whether this idea uh, of, of the sequence, which was such a raw expression of feeling essentially could work. And I wanted to find out by making it and not by playing it safe on the page. However, what's up with Callum remained a question. And we went through the lab, uh, had great sessions with with great writers. We had our final um, kind of farewell Zoom. My editor, Blair, came over. We had a drink of whiskey. And then I had one final session. And I had a final session with an advisor who was in Australia. So the time zones had been difficult. And I was so checked out by this point because it had been a month of like nine to five Zooms. It was a lot. We weren't used to that world yet. And so I came on, I thought, okay, we're just going to get through this. And she just did not let me off the hook for an hour, an hour and a half about this character. She wouldn't let me wriggle out of it. She wouldn't let me deflect. She just pressed me on who this character was and what was wrong and why. And it's not that those questions are answered definitively in the film, but it, it, it did force me to concentrate my attention onto that character. And... There were two major redrafts that came out of the Sundance Labs or or two major decisions um, beyond the the rave sequence. 
One was a redraft, and it was the last redraft in which I, I laid these index cards on the floor. That was the stage that I was at at that point. And I laid down only the scenes in which Callum was alone first, so that I had for myself a crystal clear understanding of the accumulation of his um, you know, private moments as they revealed his private struggle to the audience. I'm looking down at my floor because I'm here where I did it. And I added scenes and, and I made that more specific and I offered more opportunity for insight. I never gave all the answers. I was never interested in doing that. I never wanted to shoot something that I didn't want to be in the film because you put yourself in a very difficult position if it's there and other people want it. Uh, and so I never put myself in that position, but it did allow me to see for the first time exactly what I was doing and how I was building the character of Callum. And, and where I was leaving the character of Callum. So would you say that the early iteration of After Sun was really what most people would see as a traditional coming-of-age story for Sophie, the 11-year-old girl, in which her parent was really more, I don't want to say cardboard cut, cut out, but, but just what you would expect, okay? Like, like dad in movie, you know, dad of daughter. He doesn't fully understand her. There's some three dimension to him at all, but absolutely not like what we see in the in the in the finished form. So would you say that that's where those questions were coming from? Because he was just dad or was he at that point slightly battling between being cardboard cutout dad and an iteration of your own father, which I know influenced you as well. And you just were torn as to which way to go. I'm not sure if it was either of those things. I think okay. I think the, the, at the very the, the point of conception of the project that may have been true, and it, I think it was a more straightforward coming of age story. But by the time I I had it on the page, by the time I had that 78 page first draft, I, I was surprised about what was on the page. I was surprised that these these rave sequences were not in the outline. It's worth saying, and I've been searching. I've tipped. I've tipped my space upside down looking for this outline and it was on paper and it was you know pre-scrivener and i don't have it actually was it pre-scrivener can it have been i i'm i'm swear i will find this someday but but i don't i don't think the the rave was in the outline and so that was a surprise on the page and that revealed to me what this project was really about and what it is that i was drawn to and what it is i was trying to express and, and so no i think the character of callum was in some ways the character that he is and he certainly was struggling that was always true it his struggle just wasn't legible to to the audience it was too opaque there wasn't enough to connect with in terms of him as a character and i'm sure some people still have that problem with the final cut but fortunately they seem to be in more of a minority than i think we ever expected to be true and the legibility of callum continued to be something that we grappled with in the edit it was still something that took a lot of refining yeah we'll we'll, yeah we'll totally get into that in the spoilers of course because there's there's just a few things to talk about just the other thing which is somewhat tied to this in terms of is it was a more conventional script i'd say in the first draft that the tension in the film came from their relationship. And that was falling into some cliches, I think, of, of parent-child relationships where it kind of looked like built like an explosive fight and and then they really went their separate ways. And and there is a moment where, you know, they they, they argue yeah. in the film. But it isn't outside the realm of of what might happen on a holiday where there are ebbs and flows. Yeah. You know, and it, it wasn't as explosive as I think it had been in that draft. And so the other major change that came out of the Sundance Lab, rather than making the film conform more to a traditional structure or three act narrative, I removed all of the tension <laughs> that was from within their relationship. And I realized that I wanted this relationship to be loving from the very first frame. Like, I didn't want it to be a distant relationship. I, I wanted it to be warm and intimate. And the tension, therefore, had to be coming from elsewhere in the film and ultimately from their and more complicated, if not melancholic, individual experiences. And that those two things are not mutually exclusive. And when I understood that, I was able to free myself from the tension coming from within them and redistribute it to, to where it it was better serving my intention. Just the final question on budget. What, you know, and then we'll get into the spoilers. What was the budget and the schedule? The budget, I don't know the final number of the budget. I think it was around three million okay. in dollars. We had so many, we had three currencies in, in play here, but I know it was it was between two and a half and, and three. It got me 28 
29 days of oh, shooting, great. which was 30 in the end because we did pick up a day, which is a story in it, all of its own, if you'd like to hear it later. I do. And we're going to get into the spoilers right now. So how about this? Podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify, YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine, YouTube page where you could see these Zoom interviews. You 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 could see our faces as, as we try and get through the misery of writing and discuss it. Press pause right now if you haven't seen After Sun. Go out and see it. You could find it. Mask up and see it in the theater. Find it online and, and pay to rent it. It'll probably be streaming at some point soon if it's not already. Um, and then come back and hear the rest of this because we are getting into the spoilers right now. Really just one question for you. What's the deal with Callum? I'm joking. Sorry, you, <laughs> set that, you set that up. It was too easy. What's but, up with Callum? But but, here's, but here's, here's what's so fascinating about the fact that that came up earlier. What's the deal with Callum truly is one of the interesting engines of this movie. Because yeah. by not telling us exactly what is up with Callum, it's not just making us guess, but it's as you said, it took the tension out of the movie. I think a situation like that where you don't have clear definitions actually sometimes adds tension. And in this movie, there was a few places where I thought, oh, God, things are going to get dark. And I was glad that overall they didn't uh, in the in the in the ways that I thought that they were going. And it's interesting because it's almost a study of exposition about what exactly do you tell the audience and when do you tell them? So people have talked yep. about. After Sun is a movie about grief. People have talked about, obviously, mental health, because whatever's going on with Callum, mental health is certainly a part of it. Some people yeah. have wondered if drug addiction was a possibility or problem, although, to be brutally honest, we do not see any evidence of that. He has one beer. He doesn't get tanked to to from the cut, you know, that is the final cut. And so... It's very interesting for people to make their own assumptions of what happens because people then wonder, is the character of Sophie looking back and reminiscing because clearly she is in a state of, of grief thinking about her father. For all we know, he could have died of natural causes. He could have died of a drug overdose. He, he could have taken his own life and it's undefined. And I'm curious if, you know, if you don't want to discuss it, and I totally understand why, was it ever more defined in an earlier draft? I guess, whatever the it is. Ah, it's so hard to speak to this question. And I'm and I'm not telling you to, to talk about something you don't want to talk about or you want to leave no, 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 no. the audience's mind. But but did you ever define some of the things that were haunting him? Maybe in a very early draft of the script that there I need to go back and look at the first draft actually. There there may have been something more explicit conversation. There was another character, the character of Belinda, the turret played a much bigger role in that first draft. How so? Was she a surrogate mother since they're divorced and the mom isn't there? No, she was more of a, a love interest that he would sneak uh -huh. off with at, at night. That's a big cut there. It's a huge cut. It's a big cut. Uh, it was distracting. It, it was conforming to a different story and a remnant of, of something else, I think. Look, what is wrong? What's up with Callum is, is a question I ultimately had to answer for myself so that I could write Callum with specificity and mental health is ultimately what's up with Callum. What's interesting though, and Paul was the first one to articulate this, although I, I knew it, I just had never considered it quite in this way, is that Callum doesn't really know what's up with Callum. You know, like Callum is struggling profoundly. Callum feels moments of intense desperation. But I think Callum is also struggling to acknowledge that and certainly to seek help, both it, like acknowledged to, to Sophie, to, and but I meant more it, to himself. And so I wanted to be specific about what it meant for him not to be able to sleep or to be sobbing on the bed. Like I, I knew these moments were building. I also knew that I wasn't giving any answers. And, and you say it could have been this or it could have been that, but Having, you know, heard some people's responses, there are people who say with no shadow of a doubt, it was this, it was that. And this and that are sometimes completely different things. You know, it was a drug overdose. It was a terminal illness. And with absolute conviction and reasoning, and I think the essential part here is that their reasoning is often informed by their personal experiences in the world. And I knew that space was there. And I think that the most kind of profound responses that, that I've received that have felt the most meaningful are people who either themselves or their family members have suffered 
with depression and 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 mental illness who feel like the film was an authentic portrayal of that and the thing about many mental illnesses is that the symptoms you know overlap and and many are difficult to diagnose and pinpoint it could be diagnosed as one thing it could really be another it, it could be something else and and i knew that there was a, a kind of venn diagram you know of sorts and and i was focusing on on these things and i knew that that the audience would bring their own experience and that felt important which is why i didn't want to spell out because i was less interested in articulating what was wrong with callum i was more interested in you feeling sophie's longing and her desire to to cross time and to reach back and to remember and to see more and to question whether she had missed something and of course she hadn't because she was a child and it was not there for her to see and and ultimately to feel the love that existed between them that endures in spite of this immense loss that we feel at the end of the film and so regardless of people's interpretations of exactly quote what's up with Callum it was legible enough coming back to writing that something was profoundly up with Callum and that's what wasn't legible in those early drafts that there is enough understanding that there is something yeah. wrong that uh, that informs the connection to the feeling that the film builds toward and i am most interested in film as a vehicle to express feeling and allowing audiences to connect with that feeling and i know i lose people along the way with the shorts i lost a lot of people along the way i expected to lose a lot of people along the way with after sun and for some reason the ratio inverted and i managed to connect with a lot more people than i ever thought possible and and maybe that is the seven years that it was from beginning to end and really crafting what's up with callum and focusing the building of tension in the right places and having faith just like the faith that writing will always be miserable but you'll get there in the end that issuing conventional dialogue driven exposition in in favor of feeling and connecting more strongly with people had worked out in the past and i had some faith in that and i was never I, i never expected to again reach so many people but that was okay with me i would always rather connect more strongly with fewer people than more yeah. generally or yeah. vaguely and less memorably with with everyone yeah well i mean it's interesting that you we were talking about the subconscious earlier so it's interesting by talking about the subconscious earlier that what you capitalized on okay. was in the concept of what's up with Callum by showing us just enough to let other people's personal experiences come in you're getting into the subconscious again it's honestly no different from what happened in jaws to an extent you know they wanted more shark but the shark bruce would not work and they realized that yep. people were creating things in their own minds on their own that were scarier than any special effect that they could put up and so here people are making a personal connection because they're filling in the gaps of what the exposition is missing and and, and I mean that yeah. as a compliment I mean it I mean it in a good way oh I, I I take it as one what's up with Callum could be a good alternate title to after Sun I I kind of <laughs> like what's up with Callum now but but you know you talked about the structure and it is an interesting structure you have two structural things going on you have her you have adult Sophie going through the old tapes of their trip you see footage from the old tapes of their trip and you have the rave which is a scene in some sort of a dark dance space with a strobe light and you're catching yep. glimpses of Callum which is very thematic because that's what this movie is doing you were catching just yep. glimpses of Callum when did those those structural elements come about the dv was in the outline i believe that's an interesting question i haven't thought of it i certainly remember conceiving of the dv and adding it as a layer and knowing it would make my life more difficult but i felt like it would bring value both to to anchor certain moments of the holiday as preserved yeah and also as a tool for point of view and allowing a direct point of view of both callum which no longer exists and and of sophie as as a child the rave emerged on the page i didn't expect it and i didn't know where it was going but there it was and it felt in many ways like a representation of my journey writing the film up until that point which is why i questioned whether it would remain whether it was just something i had to excise from myself in that first draft and then remove 
but ultimately it was so integral to what I was doing. And uh, aside from offering glimpses of Callum was a, a kind of representation of, of Sophie trying to close the gap and, and reach through many obstacles to, to hold him, to see him clearly. And so the question, once I had that on the first page, was where do these elements fall? What is the point of view of the film? Is it Sophie? Is it Callum? Can it be both? Can it be adult Sophie? Can it be all three? I, I come from making shorts where really I think you're almost always, though I'm sure there are exceptions to this, almost always surf by really focusing in on one point of view. That isn't true of features. And that was something that took a little bit of time for me to understand. Eventually, I came to understand that adult Sophie was the driving point of view in the film, and that's why the rape was there, and that's why the tapes were there, and that everything else was to some degree imagined um, or remembered, remembered or imagined. And then it becomes a question of, well, why do we enter the rave here? Why do we see DV here? I wanted the DV to be really banal. In the first draft, it probably did serve a more plotty function of moving things along or revealing more or Sophie kind of spying on Callum in a certain way. And I realized that's just not what DV footage is. DV footage is excruciatingly boring of yeah. people's holidays. And that's what I wanted this to be. And I wanted it to be something where Sophie would be straining to see beyond the frame because what was held on screen isn't what she wanted to see. You know, there's really no clear image of Callum in the DV. Right. She's not going to find it like going back as an adult. Yeah. And, and which is why she's, she's attempting to fill in the gaps to some degree. Yeah. So once I understood that point of view, it really helped me rewrite the script and, and understand my intention and, and why we were seeing Callum alone. And of course had a huge impact on our shooting strategy. Once it came to, came to conversations with Greg or cinematographer about how to shoot the film and how to represent these points of view, because the page, it's so easy to cheat on the page you can you can have in the opening line of your script adult sophie age 31 stands in a rave and alternates with a younger version of herself on the turn of the stroke and she sees callum the same age and appearance as he is on the holiday age 30 or 31 you can spell these things out and then you get to shooting them or you come into the edit and it's like whoa hold on like how do we know this is adult sophie you know like, have we have we sufficiently established the visual connection between these two people? Okay, maybe they should be wearing the same thing. I, I kind of had the foresight to add that even on the page. But but how do we communicate to the audience these these are the same person? And that was a struggle in the script because there were points in which I didn't make clear who this woman was in, until halfway through the script that, that I allowed that to be a mystery because there's only so many questions your audience can be asking at one time. Sure, and then there are different ways to address, you know, tension in 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 a film. In asking yourself, like, what is the story? What is the engine? What is the tension? What questions are your audience asking? Is one that I really like, and it's something I think about in in every scene. And that's not to say that you can't just sit and watch two characters kick back and and relax by a pool. You know, if if like I'm very content just to watch people be especially in, in the opening of films, to discover them by watching. But ultimately, there's always something. You're always raising a question or asking an audience to lean in. That That's a really fun part of writing and thinking about emotional transitions in and out of these elements. Ooh, hey, I'm just jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. We just turned 10 this year, and we couldn't have done it without you. So thanks so much for supporting independent film journalism. And, you know, look, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us. You could read the free issue of Backstory on a desktop or laptop or or via our iPad app, which coincidentally is called Backstory. Now is the perfect time to subscribe because we just published our Wakanda Forever issue, which has a lot of award season stuff in it as well. You could see the full table of contents over at Backstory.net. So there is a lot to explore. And you know, if you want to subscribe to Sweeten the Deal, I am offering discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five. It works over at Backstory.net. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our conversation with writer-director Charlotte Wells about her debut feature film, After Sun. As you just said, 
you know, you're asking questions, but if all you do is ask questions and never provide any answers, the audience could get frustrated. And what's interesting is you do provide one insight into Callum. And it's the scene where multiple times Sophie's been asking him about what did you think you would be as an adult when you were 11? Because she's 11. And then she keeps talking about him being 11 and you have very interesting shot composition in the movie. You have a lot of long takes, which, which works really well. But at this point, he takes the camera away from her and puts it down by the television. And we see the two of them reflected in the dark screen of the television. And he just lays down on the bed and talks about his 11th birthday, which was, you know, a total disaster. His parents forgot it was his birthday. They argued because they forgot it was his birthday. They dragged him to the toy store yelling, what do you want? And he was just caught in the middle of it. And that's the one thing that we see that like, okay, Callum's being more of a protective, trying to be a good father to her because he doesn't want her to have the bad childhood that he did. And that's just an interpretation that's going beyond what the script says. But, but, you know, he's definitely a loving father to her. And it's interesting that you showed that. And it was fascinating that you showed that entire monologue, which would be, you know, the meat that an actor might sign on to a project for as a pale, dim reflection on a television screen. So I'm just curious about yep. when you decided to shoot it like that, because it was punk rock. I respect it, but I could see a million other directors going with something. I, I won't even say more traditional, but so you could see your actor talking, you know, and I, again, I love the performance. I love the scene, but when did that idea come into being? You're going to laugh at the answer, I think. Um, the answer is that you see a lot more in the frame in the final cut than you did on the page. Because in the page, he pulls the cord. And rather than being reflected in the TV, the TV is positioned in a almost impossible geographic room. That sometimes happens when you write on the page and you realize once you're forced to articulate what that room is, that it is L-shaped and doesn't make any sense. But I imagined always that conversation playing out and you just seeing their shoes kind of sitting side by side on the bed and you'd see their feet on the edge oh. of frame. And th there's another moment analogous to that in the film. And that's when they're having a conversation about, you know, you can do drugs, you can go to parties, you can kind of see boys, just talk to me about it, you know, and it takes place on a float set out, you know, they're like 50 feet from the shore. Right. That was a moment where Paul definitely looked twice <laughs> when I told him how we were shooting it because it wasn't written that way on the page. And both of those moments, what they have in common, I think, are conversations that are specifically remembered. And I think the thing about those moments in our lives is that sometimes something that somebody says to you resonates so strongly, you hold it forever but you can't exactly fill out the place that you were in you might have an impression you were in a car you were you were out at sea you were in the room but you really don't hold the details what you hold is exactly what was said and that it's what i was trying to represent in feeling by shooting them in that way however because the room i constructed in my head was not viable we organized this room and realized the gift of these old OCR televisions is that they have this convex screen and that convex screen allowed for at a certain point in that image definitely like visually it's one of my favorite parts of the film there are four four maybe five images on screen because you have the reflection you know you see him on the balcony it, in the reflection of the tv because it curves you you see him on the screen of the camera you, you see her in the, the mirror there are just so many yeah. images on screen at once and i really enjoyed that and i think seeing it play out as a reflection the fact that frankie placed the camera right next to the television so you still see it it, it, it just it worked it really did right. work. I mean, there's and... a lot going on in that shot that, and, and even for a shot that seems like it's, I mean, it is static, but, but seems like, you know, you're focusing on an empty, you know, turned off TV screen. It's, it's, it's fantastic. So that's, that's good to hear that that's how it was in your head. Paul placed a lot of trust in me in this, you know, he trusted that I was creating meaning out of sequences of images that may not feel like they held a lot in and of themselves. And, and just those are two examples where he trusted that we were doing something visually that was important and that it wasn't about their bodies. I mean, there's a lot more to performance than seeing somebody's face as they're talking. That's all. I mean, again, another moment that's off screen is, you know, you talked earlier about the typical father-daughter argument that happens and you were talking about other father-daughter films and, you know, even in eighth grade, right? Which won a WGA award. It's a, it's another great father-daughter film. Like, you know, they have their arguments, but here she misinterprets why he won't do REM karaoke with her, even though they've done it in the past. He's just not in the mood. He's not feeling it, whatever it is. 
and she gets mad at him. That gives us a little more exposition because it again reinforces the possibility of money problems and other problems that he's having with stability. And he splits off and we do track him for a while. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting to see where he goes. By the end of it, he is literally walking into the ocean, you know, pitch black. And I was very yep. curious if you were ever going to show us more. Was there ever on the page anything more to that? Because it was fascinating because, you know, we see him in bed naked asleep when she comes home. Was there more to his night out alone? Yeah, in early in the very first draft, there, there there was yeah. Again, there there were two additional characters in that first draft, and that that was a moment in which their kind of worlds converged, and it was you know like led to a like explosive drunken fight of sorts. I mean, very sloppy, not not fight, but it was clear at that point that he was extremely drunk and not entirely in control of what he was doing. And then at that point, perhaps walked into the sea. I mean, but there there. Oh, do I, do I divulge things that were in earlier cuts? Um, it's tricky because what's in the film is what should be in the film. And I don't think the film should be contextualized by things that are on the cutting room floor because they're there for a reason. Of course. But there was another moment in, in the film in which he left, he leaves and, and you see him at a bar and you see him kind of with a girl and you get a sense that he's living this, this other life at night. But it, it didn't feel... It didn't feel right. It didn't feel like it was serving the story and it felt like it was confusing the emotion and, and his arc as a character. A deletion like that refocuses the father-daughter relationship and the mystery the daughter yep. has about her father. So, of course, exactly. his definition wouldn't work because that's filling in too much of a blank. So that does make sense. It took a long time. These decisions took a long time. Like they were in many, many cuts and only when you cut them do you do you see what it feels like if they're not there and... And it, it did simplify the emotion. It also raises a lot of questions, you know? That specific moment I was just talking about, it happens on the earlier night after he's tucking her into bed and now it cuts to the rave and the, the pulling back of the door. And that felt like a feeling to me rather than seeing him him go out that night. It didn't, it was confusing. It, it, it asked questions that we weren't prepared to answer. And perhaps you could say we do that elsewhere in the film, but always with intent, always reflecting Sophie as an adult, like her search for answers yeah. and i think that was the real tension is there are no answers she has no answers that's the point you know and so of course the answers are not going to be on screen it's just how do you place the questions and how do you play with this idea that some of what you're seeing of him alone is maybe in some sense her imagining there's one reason that it cuts then to her sleeping Right. In the reception, it starts to create this feeling. Is it a dream? Is it her dream? Whose dream is it? What does it mean? And the answer is always, what does it feel? Yeah. Which again, I can hear people yelling at me for saying that, but it's no, true. That's how I see it. Nobody's yelling. I, I love this film. And again, the, the other thing that you show the most of, of what's up with Callum is the most glorious shot in the movie where Sophie gets everybody at an amphitheater, uh, you know, like an ancient amphitheater. They're touring to sing happy birthday to him. And he's standing above them yep. all in just like a hero shot. And you do a very long dissolve. And so few people embrace a dissolve these days. So it was beautiful to see. And it is of him with his back to the audience, crying at night alone, sitting up in bed. And you leave those two images to show these two sides to him, the public facing, it's my birthday, I'm a fully functional dad, and this man just breaking down without definition again. And that was just glorious. So was that always intended to be a doubled in image or was that something that you realized in editing could be just a you know standout moment? No, it was a discovery in the edit. I am... Um personally very partial to the dissolve and that was one that i was playing around with footage and found and was really struck by the composition and, and what it meant and again it's, it's an example of a scene in which there was a little bit more context around it in the script in the script you saw where she was in that moment she was outside with those kids, the kids that they see on the first day at the pool that she says, no, I'm not going to hang out with them. They're just yeah. kids. Those kids recur a little bit more in this script than they do in the final film. And in that moment, she finally sits with them, you know, which is kind of in conversation with this idea that she has in that karaoke scene developed the self-consciousness that, that feels like a step toward adolescence, knows it and wants to retreat to the childhood she 
can no longer have because she has taken that step. And so she's sitting with these kids finally, but it just didn't work. It didn't feel right. It, that that moment was very difficult in terms of production. And then the feeling was very different of, of that dissolve and, and holding that moment kind of out of time a little bit and then cutting to the postcard on the floor and then cutting to the sequence which absolutely wasn't on the page where we suddenly see these sequences of images most of which they're not in that feel like they could be then they also feel like they could be now and there is a permanence to place which is the idea of, of many of those shots in the film you know doesn't relate to people relationships change and people grow people live people die but that amphitheater endures you know it's just a standout moment and i absolutely love the fact that it is cut out of time because obviously it's daytime when he's standing up there and it is most certainly nighttime when he's in bed where it's at least a darkened room and it just it just again helps with that subconscious temporal flow of the movie and i guess that that brings me to adult sophie again another place when she and her girlfriend are talking at night you could see there being a major conversation that she's having about reflection or what she's feeling. And, and again, it's, you know, something that could come out in dialogue of, of what this adult is feeling going through these tapes, remembering her dad, but it's just not there. Like there's, there's, oh. there's nothing at all there between the two, you know, that they're partners, you know, they have a baby, but that's, yep. that's it. And, and by the way, that's completely enough. And again, I'm not trying to like keep asking the same question, but it's interesting for people to learn from the process of shedding those extra layers. Was there ever a version where there was a big dialogue scene with Sophie and her partner? Or or was it kind of always that way in which you're getting a glimpse of her life now and you're not going to get all the blanks filled in the same way? that you don't with Callum. I was interested in creating a film about memory and one person's memory without really, almost with the rave. The the rave is most representative of this is adult Sophie. She is looking back. She is, you know, in this kind of psychic journey to better understand her father. Simplification, but for the purposes of this. And so, no, there was never really more of her in the kind of present day timeline with her partner. What there was in the very first draft was Sophie as an adult on the holiday, not on a holiday in the present day, but physically occupying spaces in a kind of spectral Uncle Scrooge Christmas Carol kind of way, where at first she was absolutely passive and it built. So the climax, while the very first draft of the script began and ended in the rave, the real climax of that film, that script, wasn't the rave per se so much as a confrontation between Sophie and Callum. At first she is passive in the scenes, it escalates to the point where she's able to like, pick up a t-shirt and fold it. It's the scene where he swims out to the sea. He did it in daylight and, and he takes off his t-shirt and she sits and she watches him and she folds it and she puts it on the wall. And then it builds to this confrontation. It's yeah, a facet of the original script I often forget. And it's because it wasn't additive. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it just didn't feel like it was what it felt like it was doing actually was providing a layer between the film and the audience. And it was saying, here is your kind of conduit, you know, like this is feel what this person is feeling rather than feeling what you're feeling as an audience member. It, it was distracting. It was yeah. preventing like a, a real connection between the audience and the film. But it was your first piece of clay. So you had to get it out there. And again, coming back yeah. to the rave, it's so fascinating that ending shot in which he drops her off at the airport and she's leaving and he's filming her with the camera. And then he walks through the airport doors and you see the rave lights behind. And that was just a really good bookend because it shows that mysterious space where we only catch glimpses of Callum, he's now going back to. And people get interpreted a lot of different ways. When did that idea hit you as as a great closing moment? Yeah, it's a good question because I think in writing, some things are instinct. The rave was instinct, pure, pure, messy instinct. And the end was earned (laughs) through the extremely hard work of redrafting and trying to address questions and offer something that bound together the different perspectives held within the film and and something that offered a resolution. I mean, it's a resolution in the way that you said it is. It can be interpreted in different ways. It felt like a resolution to me. You know, he is back in this void. <laughs> Uh, they don't see each other again it is to me representative of his death i mean that i'm willing to say like to me this is a film about grief 
You know, he dies shortly after the holiday. Not everybody needs to experience the film that way to connect with it. So I'm not going to deny other people's experiences of watching the film. But to me, that's what it is. And I thought of a thousand ways this film could begin and end. And and I remember talking for hours with Adela, my producer, just talking through possibilities. You know, what about this? What about that? What if Sophie's in the rave space at the beginning and end or at the beginning and she sees kids, Sophie and Callum, kind of run through and they go through the double doors and that takes them into the airport. Actually, that's probably how the end came to be now that I think about it, because I'd explored the idea at the beginning and kind of placed in my head a connection between the rave and the airport. Interesting. Yeah, it's funny. I, these are things I've genuinely forgotten. I haven't really had a conversation this in depth about the script and earlier drafts, but I really was thinking about every possible way to connect adult Sophie to child Sophie and these characters and to just articulate the feeling that I wanted at the end of the film. And so anchoring the videotapes in adult Sophie's kind of experience, because there's a question, who's watching these? You know, right. it could have been him. That occurred to me too. What if he he's the, the one watching the, the tapes? Camera. What if we, he has the camera, the tapes are his, they're there for him to, to hold on to her when they're not together. You know, she is, she points the camera at him from time to time, but most of the DV footage is of her. There's more of him in it than I'd maybe expected in some ways. It felt like a way to, to bind the worlds. And there were points at which like, like again, Adela, my producer, I remember her saying, I don't think you're going to need him walking through the doors, but we should absolutely shoot it. And in the first cut, I didn't include it. And she was like, what are you doing? You need to see him walking through the doors, <laughs> which is why you have enough on the page. I mean, that was maybe the most valuable writing lesson that I learned. It's like, you have to have enough because you don't execute perfectly. You just can't. It's not how filmmaking works. There's too many variables and too many disasters and fires to put out, literally in our case, because there were wildfires that caused us to evacuate during shooting. Wow. And so there just needs to be enough. There needs to be enough for audiences to find their own path through the film. You need to know that every detail that you place is not going to be perceived by an individual audience member. And and there needs to be enough when you don't execute properly that, that it still is one, you know, that it's held together by something strong enough to, to support it. And the end and finding her on the couch and, and finding the wall, it just felt it felt right. It felt like a way to transfer the moment in the airport to Sophie on the couch to you know her her image of Callum what I didn't necessarily expect was that it would end on the doors because on the page the camera comes back around and it finds her back on the couch and either you hear the baby babbling not crying and, and she gets up and she goes to it and it leaves with an empty couch and maybe it comes back around and you find that image of the two of them sitting at the water together that we see at the end of the the montage after he's crying but the image of him walking through those doors was so strong there was no question that you there was anywhere to go after you see that and you'd already in there you'd had them dancing together kind of or her holding him trying to hold him yeah. both as young and old so you'd already accomplished that so it really is just a perfect ending beat i know we've gone yep. over time a little I, I guess a question i definitely have for you is what was your toughest scene on the page and or as director what, what was your toughest scene the one that you went back to over and over again and how did you creatively rise to that challenge it was the rape <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it was the rape. That was the greatest struggle because it was the thing that felt most unusual about the script and most challenging to read because it is so visual and it is something that, that ultimately is made for film and isn't made for prose or, or to read. And um, convincing not just other people, but in order to convince other people to convince myself that this, this was absolutely essential to what I was saying. I think that was it in addition to what's up with Callum. I don't know that there was an individual scene um, I think it really was always structural. It definitely works. I, I love your music choices. I was so glad to hear some blur in there. And of course, of course, it, it was it was amazing all the music that you got, especially for a low budget film. So that was that was fantastic as well. I guess the only other thing I really wanted to know was your shot of the Polaroid. I love I love the shot when they're kissing and you, it's reflected in the glass with the security guard. That was one of the other favorite shots that I had. That was just fantastic. But the Polaroid was again another great way to do a scene where you're not looking at your actors and it has a thematic resonance to it. And, you know, some actors would get kind of annoyed that you're doing that, but of course your actors knew what path you were on. When did, when did that idea come about? Well, the dialogue that plays under that scene was improvised. We, we talked about what it might be, but the scene itself has ended on the page and in a wider take. Sometimes it's fun just to let things roll, you know, and, and see what's said and see where it goes and, Sometimes it's awkward and nothing interesting comes of it. And other times 
you have this really charming, thoughtful dialogue. I, I mean, I always laugh when I hear what Frankie says there because she says we can't stay in hotels for the rest of our lives, which is just so indicative of a child who has spent two months in a hotel, yeah. <laughs> not a kid who has been away for a week. But that was them. And so we had this dialogue and the Polaroid was on the page. The Polaroid was on the page and I do know when I added it because I stole it from another film called The Metamorphosis of Birds, which is Portuguese film. It's a really interesting doc fiction hybrid of sorts. And I believe in that there is a developing photograph and I remember seeing it and I, I really, I hope that's right. I should probably fact check that, but that is my memory of where that emerged from. Hey, memories and, um, can be and I wrote it sometimes. in. They sure can. They but, sure but, can. But but I think that that inspired it. And it felt it just felt so appropriate to the the film. And it, you know, it's, it's one of many things that we got. You don't necessarily know if there's a place for them, but in this case, there there was. And it, I think it was representative a lot more than I even realized when I wrote it. Well, I just wanted to spell this myth because you brought up improvisation, and I know that overall, from everything I've read, most of the film was actually scripted dialogue, and it was not improvised. Would you yep. agree with that? I think I, I read somewhere Paul say ninety five percent. I think it's probably true. Even the DV improvisation is it's tricky. I mean, these were not outlined scenes that provided a setup, and the dialogue was improvised. Did the actors sometimes deviate from exactly the words on the page? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially Frankie, where sometimes we would give her, you know, a phrase to land on and allow her to find her own way there if, if she needed to. Sure. But no, I, the 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 film isn't improvised, and I think that's credit to the actors' wonderfully naturalistic performances that helps give that impression. Well. Look, I absolutely love your film. You have been so generous with your time, and I absolutely cannot wait to see what you have to do next. Charlotte, thanks for hanging thank out you. and talking about it today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for making me revisit that time, <laughs> that script. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to writer-director Charlotte Wells for being so generous with her time and chatting about her debut feature film, after Sun. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, we just turned 10 this year and we couldn't have done it without you. And you know, now is the perfect time to subscribe because we published our Wakanda Forever issue, which has a lot of great award season coverage in it. And you could see our full table of contents over at Backstory.net. If you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading a free full issue over at Backstory.net or in our our iPad app backstory. And of course, to sweeten the deal, I want to give you a $5 off coupon, which is discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five, and that will get you $5 off a one-year subscription. And you could just enter that code at the shopping cart at Backstory.net. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. This Q&A and the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith is a copyright of unlike Likely Films Incorporated in 2023. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to reach out to me, the easiest way to find me is on Twitter. I'm Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag. You could also find me on Instagram as Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag. Or you could look at my Facebook fan page, which I have set up for Jeff Goldsmith. I don't check that as much. I'm trying to get better this year. And of course, you could always email us at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. And it might take me a heartbeat to get back to you via email, but I do go through it and try and respond to everybody that I can. So that's the other way to reach me as well. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.